On June 8, Relativity Space, a California-based company founded in 2015 revealed details of Terran R, a new two-stage rocket that will be launching satellites to orbit three years from now. Terran R is a 3D printed vehicle designed to haul more than 20 metric tons of cargo to low Earth orbit from a launch pad at Cape Canaveral. Resembling a smaller version of SpaceX's giant Starship rocket, the Terran R follows the development of Relativity's Terran 1 rocket, an expendable launcher sized to place small satellites into orbit. Terran R will stand 66 meters tall and measure 5 meters in diameter. The first stage will use 70 on R engines, each producing 1,343 kilonewtons of thrust, while the second stage will use a single Eon vacuum engine. The engines are based on the Eon 1 engine relativity created for the Terran 1 and use methane and liquid oxygen propellants. Relativity said it completed full duration testing of a Pathfinder engine earlier this year. Another key element of the rocket is Relativity's intent to make the vehicle fully reusable, including its upper stage and payload fairing. The second stage and payload fairing, built as a single unit, will fly into orbit, release its payload and complete its mission, then re-enter the Earth's atmosphere for landing. Relativity did not say whether it plans to recover the first stage using propulsive landing, like SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Starship rockets, or to recover the booster after a successful ocean splashdown, just like Rocket Lab's Electron rocket. Like the Terran 1, the Terran R and its engines will be built using innovative 3D printers at Relativity's factory. This makes the rocket and its engines faster and cheaper to build and far easier to assemble. This manufacturing strategy allows Relativity Space to build rockets with 100 times fewer parts and 10 times faster than those of its competitors. The company says it aims to produce an entire Terran rocket in 60 days. With this new rocket, Relativity is aiming to exceed the Falcon 9 payload to low Earth orbit by approximately 20%. The company announced on Tuesday that it has raised $650 million in a new funding round to support the development of Terran R. The rocket will be ready for launch in 2024. Blue Origin's month-long auction for a trip to the edge of space with its founder Jeff Bezos ended on Saturday with a closing price of $28 million. The flight aboard New Shepard, slated for July 20, will mark the company's first mission flying humans, in which the winning bidder will bask in a few minutes of microgravity before returning back to land. The winning bid came on Saturday during a live auction, which saw 7,600 registered bidders from 159 countries compete for the spot. This was the culmination of Blue Origin's three-part bidding process for the ticket, which included a blind auction first, followed by an unsealed online auction, with the highest bid posted to the company's website whenever it changed. The live bidding opened at $4.8 million, but accelerated quickly above $20 million within the first few minutes of the auction and concluded in a winning bid of $28 million. The company is donating the fund raised from the auction to its Club for the Future Nonprofit Foundation, which is focused on encouraging kids to pursue careers in STEM. The identity of the winner won't be revealed for a few weeks, Blue Origin said Saturday. Earlier on June 7, Blue Origin founder Jeff Bezos announced that he will fly on the first crewed flight of the New Shepard suborbital vehicle on July 20, with his brother Mark Bezos and two other passengers. One of the accompanying passengers is the winner of Saturday's auction, while the fourth member will be announced in the coming weeks. New Shepard, a rocket that carries a capsule to an altitude of over 100 kilometers, has flown more than a dozen successful test flights without passengers, including one in April at the company's facility in the Texas desert. The autonomous system is designed to carry up to six people. The capsule has massive windows to give passengers a view of the Earth below for about three minutes in zero gravity before returning to Earth. Check out our previous video to learn about the complete mission profile, link in the description. Three months ago, NASA completed stacking the Space Launch System's solid rocket boosters for the agency's Artemis 1 mission. Over several weeks, workers used massive cranes to place the 10 booster segments and nose assemblies on the mobile launcher inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. And last week, workers retracted most of the platforms of the 54 meters tall rocket boosters to prepare for the integration of the massive core stage. On Thursday, technicians inside the Vehicle Assembly Building began a delicate multi-day task to lift the 85,000 kg core stage for mounting between the boosters. Two cranes began raising the 65-meter-long core stage inside the assembly building's transfer aisle. The teams then maneuvered the core stage vertical to allow ground crews to disconnect one of the cranes attached to the aft end of the rocket. The core stage was then moved towards the already stacked solid rocket boosters. On June 12, a crane gently lowered the 8.4 meters diameter core stage between the two boosters. 
the core stage will now be connected and secured to the booster's forward and aft attach points. According to NASA, the entire operations could take several days. With the core stage in place, next will be the integration of the launch vehicle stage adapter or the interstage structure that will connect the main stage with the rocket's upper stage. Then the interim cryogenic propulsion system or the upper stage will be added to the rocket core stage. Once the upper stage is installed, the rocket will be subjected to a series of structural tests and tests to verify the propellant lines and fluid connections. Once that is complete, teams will install the Orion spacecraft onto the top of the rocket, an event that could happen as soon as early August. If all goes according to the plan, the first Artemis mission will lift off from Kennedy Space Center in November of this year. Two weeks ago, NASA announced Da Vinci Plus and Veritas missions to explore planet Venus. Following NASA's footsteps, the European Space Agency announced on Thursday that it has selected Envision as its next orbiter, which will visit Venus sometime in the 2030s. The mission will be conducted in collaboration with NASA, with the potential sharing of responsibilities currently under assessment. The mission will perform high-resolution radar mapping and atmospheric studies on Venus and would investigate why Venus and Earth took such different evolutionary paths. The orbiter will carry a suite of spectrometers, sounders, and a radar to study the planet's interior, surface, and atmosphere. As a key partner in the mission, NASA provides the synthetic aperture radar, called Venser, to make high-resolution measurements of the planet's surface features. The spacecraft will also carry a Venus subsurface radar sounder and a Venus spectroscopy suite with it. The Venus subsurface radar sounder will search for subsurface material boundaries in various geological terrains. Venus Spectroscopy Suite will provide compositional data on rock types, perform extremely high-resolution atmospheric measurements, and will also monitor the mysterious UV absorber in the Venusian upper clouds. Envision is planned to launch as early as 2031 on an Ariane 6 rocket. Once launched, the spacecraft will take about 15 months to reach Venus and will take 16 more months to achieve its final science orbit for a four-year science mission. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. At Starbase, SpaceX has already started to develop the gigantic super-heavy rocket that will propel Starship to orbit. Last Tuesday, SpaceX kicked off the Starship Super Heavy Boosters test campaign with a proof test of a tank referred to as BN 2.1. During the cryogenic proof test, the stainless steel tank was subjected to extremely low temperatures as it was filled with liquid nitrogen. This test caused the tank to experience high pressure to simulate the stress the rocket would experience during its flight. The test also involved pressing the aft section of the test tank with nine hydraulic rams to simulate the thrust generated by nine inner engines of the booster without actually needing to perform a static fire. The test helps engineers assess the tank's structural strength and provides them with insight to know whether the tank's construction technique and design need improvement. Testing a smaller tank is better than risking an entire booster if they come across an issue. Cameron County officials recently issued a public notice ordering a temporary closure of State Highway 4 and Boca Chica Beach from June 15 to 17. The next round of Booster BN 2.1 cryogenic proof tests may take place on these dates. During this second phase of the test campaign, SpaceX may attempt to pressure test the tank until it fails. The tank will be pressurized with cryogenic nitrogen until it bursts or leaks to validate production methods. After finishing all tests with BN 2.1, engineers can implement what they learned to prepare the Super Heavy Booster 2 prototype for testing. The 70 meters tall stainless steel vehicle is currently under assembly inside the high bay at the rocket factory. On June 9, SpaceX simultaneously rolled a massive 12 meters wide water tank and the fourth prefabricated section of SpaceX's orbital launch tower to the orbital launch site. The tank was previously thought to be the insulation shell for a GSE tank already installed at the launch site. But a label on the side of the tank revealed that this new tank is actually a water tank built in stainless steel. Water stored in this tank will be used to supply water to a deluge system. A water deluge system is a sound suppression system that sprays water onto the launch pad to help protect the rocket, launch tower, and launch pad from the extreme acoustic and temperature environment during liftoff. SpaceX uses a 106 meters tall water tower to store and supply water during Falcon 9 launches. But for the Starship, it looks like they will be storing water in tanks at ground level and will be using high-volume pumps to supply pressurized water onto the launch pad. The newly delivered tank, which measures 12 meters wide and approximately 36 meters tall, got installed at the launch site on June 11. It can hold more than 4,000 cubic meters of water in it.
The orbital launch tower segment that got rolled out along with the water tank is the fourth segment of the tower that will be installed atop the already installed tower segments. On June 11, the fifth segment of the orbital launch tower got rolled out to the launch site. The fourth and fifth segments installation will happen this week. Prior to the installation of tower segments, on June 10, the Lieber LR11350 crawler crane, also known as Kong, got fully erected at the orbital launch site. The crane, which has a maximum hook height of 220 meters and a load capacity of 1,350 tons, will be used to stack the newly arrived and forthcoming launch tower segments. Once fully assembled, the launch tower will be approximately 140 meters tall. In his recent tweet, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk mentioned that SpaceX is planning to launch Starlink Internet satellites on a Starship rocket, eventually fully replacing Falcon 9's role in the constellation. This plan is not new for SpaceX. Since dedicated Starlink launches began in May 2019, SpaceX has made it clear that the company would ultimately transition the task of launching and maintaining the Starlink constellation from Falcon 9 to Starship. Starship, which has a payload capacity of 100 tons to low Earth orbit can carry more than 400 Starlink satellites in a single launch. This is equivalent to approximately seven dedicated Falcon 9 missions. While Starlink satellites cost $250,000 each, and each launch costs about $57 million with Falcon 9, Starship is expected to cost only $2 million per launch, much cheaper than current launches. It might be several years before Starship is considered to be safe and reliable enough to launch humans, but SpaceX could feasibly start launching Starlink satellites on Starship almost as soon as it begins orbital flight tests. Recently at SpaceX's McGregor Test and Development Center, the company inaugurated two new Starship engine test stands with a static fire. SpaceX's rocket development and test facility in McGregor is used for research and development of new rocket engines, thrusters, and various components. As of last month, SpaceX had four separate Raptor test stands at McGregor, which now got risen to six. This means that SpaceX now has more capacity to test individual Starship engines, which is very much essential as it shifts its focus from suborbital three-engine Starship launches to orbital test flights with six-engine ships and 29-engine Super Heavy boosters. Every one of those 35 engines will first need to be qualified for flight via static fire tests in McGregor before being transported to Starbase, Texas. Moving on to other Starship updates, at the build site, Starship Gazer recently spotted the aft dome section of Starship serial number 20, with Raptor mounting points. Three C-level Raptors will be installed at the inner mounting points, and the remaining three vacuum engines will be installed at the peripheral mounting points. This aft dome got sleeved on June 10. Recently a huge pulley was delivered to the Starship production facility. The exact purpose of this machine part is still unknown, but it is believed to be part of the orbital launch tower lift and catch mechanism, or part of a natural gas driller. SpaceX has already assembled the ground support equipment tank number three, and the fourth tank is taking shape inside the midbay. Stacking of GSE tank shell three is in progress at the build site, and last week, workers installed the methane downcomer of Super Heavy Booster BN2 into the launch vehicle. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.